Las Vegas historical moments, 1960s. The federal government gave Boulder City to the residents and it was incorporated on January 4th, 1960. To this day, it is one of two places in Nevada where gambling is illegal. On January 20th, Joey Bishop, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, Dean Martin, and Frank Sinatra performed together for the first time at the Sands Copa Room while they were filming Ocean's Eleven in Las Vegas. The Copa Room was considered the top stage in the country, and the Summit at the Sands was the place to be during those weeks of performances. In June 1960, Playboy magazine said, The Klan, as they've been dubbed by others, possess talent, charm, romance, and a devil-may-care nonconformity that gives them immense popular appeal. So much so that today they sit at the very top of the Hollywood star system, with Sinatra king of the hill. It wasn't until the 1980s that the public and press started calling Frank, Dean, and Sammy the Rat Pack, and Sinatra did not like that name. You three guys sometimes called the Rat Pack. How do you feel about the term now that it's been a few years since it was first applied, and how did it come about? Oh, What's that's the end of the question was a very a big, a good point. I was going to bring that up, by the way, before anybody used that stupid phrase again. <laughs> it, it's now... The Rat Pack was made of uh, Humphrey Bogart, who started it all, yeah. and uh, several other people who lived in the... Uh, the small area here in Beverly Hills, and they de they decided that they would be called the Rat Pack. And then uh, one day somewhere, Sammy opened his big mouth that we were members of the Rat Pack, and that's what happened. That's really what started the whole thing. We've we've never discussed a, a term for the three of us. On February 20th, the Nevada Gaming Commission adopted a regulation that said establishments wherein gaming is conducted shall be operated in a manner suitable to protect the public health, safety, morals, good order, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the state of Nevada. Paragraph 3 says that the casino operators can lose their gaming license for catering to, assisting, employing, or associating with either socially or in business affairs persons of notorious or unsavory reputation or who have extensive police records. In March, the list of excluded persons, or Black Book, was created, and there were 11 mobsters on the initial list that included their name, photograph, description, and other identifying information. The Black Book, with a letter dated March 29, 1960, was sent to every large casino in Las Vegas and around the state requesting that casinos cooperate in banning all individuals who are on the excluded list. Black Book members Louis Dragna and Marshall Caifano sued Nevada in federal court saying, among other things, that the Black Book denied them their rights to due process as guaranteed by the 14th Amendment because there was no hearing before they were put on the list. In 1966, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled in Marshall v. Sawyer that under state gaming regulations, persons who have an extensive police record are to be excluded from establishments which operate gambling casinos. So a hearing wasn't really necessary to put the mobsters in the black book. The federal court did warn the state that they should have hearings before placing people on the list, which Nevada started doing. In 1967, the United States Supreme Court refused to hear the Marshall case because gambling is a privilege, not a right, so states can ban people from casinos after due process in order to maintain the public confidence of the gambling industry. No one whose name has gone into the black book has lived to see it removed. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, threatened the Las Vegas leaders with a protest march on the Las Vegas Strip if segregation did not end. On March 25, 1960, the day before the scheduled protest, black leaders met with the mayor, governor, law enforcement leaders at the closed Moulin Rouge, and this meeting became known as the Moulin Rouge Agreement. Las Vegas leaders verbally agreed to end segregation, but this agreement was not universally accepted by all casinos, and it wasn't until the early 1970s that casinos allowed black people to work all Las Vegas strip jobs after a United States District Court decree. On June 17th, the El Rancho Vegas burned down in the first major fire on the Strip, 
and the first resort on Highway 91 was never rebuilt and is currently the southern portion of the Las Vegas Festival Grounds. The world premiere of Ocean's Eleven was on August 3, 1960 at the Fremont Theater on Fremont Street. The nationwide release was on August 10th. The critic reviews were mixed with the New York Times critic not a fan. By the 1960s, the FBI discovered a skimming operation at the Flamingo, and on March 1, 1961, the FBI said that Meyer Lansky is one of the prominent hoodlums selected as a prime target for early federal prosecution. Bureau has directed that every resource be used toward this objective. Crime files revealed Lansky, one of the biggest mobsters ever to operate in the United States. And Lansky is the only one of the big six Eastern mobsters still around. Lansky would avoid prosecution in the 1970s due to his perceived failing health, but others were convicted and spent time in jail. In 1961, Del Webb bought the Sahara from Milton Prell and became the first publicly traded company to own a casino. Paul Williams was the first black architect in the western United States, and he designed the La Concha Motel in 1961. The La Concha Lobby is now the lobby for the Neon Museum. Williams also designed the Guardian Angel Cathedral Catholic Church just north of Encore and many other buildings in California. According to the Golden Steer Steakhouse, they have been open since 1958 and is considered the oldest steakhouse in the city of Las Vegas. But the owners in the 1990s admitted that they lost track of when the restaurant opened and decided to establish 1958 as the first year. The mall where the restaurant is located didn't open until 1960, and a family member of the original owner has said that they opened in 1962. In 1963, the Las Vegas Voice was founded, primarily covering black Las Vegas and the west side. In 1980, the Las Vegas Sentinel started, and both papers merged as the Las Vegas Sentinel Voice in 1982 but stopped publishing in 2014. President John F. Kennedy spoke at the Las Vegas Convention Center on September 28, 1963. The limited test ban treaty signed by the U.S., Great Britain, and the Soviet Union on August 5th, and it banned all nuclear weapon testing in outer space, underwater, and above ground. During the filming of Viva Las Vegas in 1963, Co-stars Elvis Presley and Anne Margaret had an affair while Elvis was dating Priscilla. The film was released on May 20, 1964. The Beatles played at the Las Vegas Convention Center on August 20 and earned $30,000 for the two shows. It was very difficult to hear the band with all the yelling. This is a recording from one of the shows. <laughs> The UK sensation stayed at the Sahara and was able to play with some slot machines in their room. In 1964, Desert co-owner Wilbur Clark organized the first professional football game in Las Vegas for his charity. The preseason AFL game between the Oakland Raiders and Houston Oilers was played at Cashman Field. Al Davis was the Raiders head coach and this game planted a seed in Davis that Vegas might be a good place for football. When the Raiders moved to Las Vegas and first played before fans in 2021, Mark Davis said, It seems like 60 years and we're finally getting to go home. After Hacienda owner Warren Doc Bailey died in 1964, his wife Judy became the first female to be a sole owner of a Las Vegas casino. Judy Bailey commissioned the famous 40-foot horse and rider sign that was the first sign restored by the Neon Museum and was placed on the corner of Fremont Street and Las Vegas Boulevard. The Stardust hosted their inaugural Grand Prix in November 1965 at the Stardust Raceway. Hap Shark in the number 66 Chaparral won the race. Caesars Palace opened on August 5, 1966 as a first themed resort and this was the last resort to build low-rise hotel buildings 
along with the high rise. On November 27, 1966, 61 year old reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes arrived in Las Vegas and he stayed on the top floor of the Desert Inn. His staff stayed on the floor below. He was the world's ultimate enigma, a man so secretive, so hidden from view that no outsider could say with certainty whether he was alive, much less how he looked or behaved. Before Howard Hughes moved to Nevada, he told Mo Dalitz, the Desert Inn owner, he only intended to stay 10 days or so. But Howard Hughes wanted to live at the DI, so in March 1967, Hughes acquired the operating rights to the Desert Inn for about $13 million from Cleveland mob boss Mo Dalitz. Hughes also paid a yearly lease of $1 million, and he paid all taxes, insurance, and maintenance on the resort. Since Howard Hughes and his staff had no experience running a casino, Mo Dalitz offered his casino management services for free, likely because he would be able to continue skimming from the casino. In 1967, Siegfried and Roy debuted at the Tropicana. Elvis and Priscilla Presley married at the Aladdin on May 1, 1967. On December 31st, Evil Knievel attempted to jump the Caesars Palace Fountains, which would be a 141-foot attempt, his longest to date. Knievel came up short on the jump, landing on the safety ramp, and he tumbled over the bike and skidded to a stop. He had a crushed pelvis and femur, fractures to his hip, wrist, and both ankles while suffering a concussion, which resulted in a multi-week hospital stay. Evil Knievel's son, Robbie, would successfully complete the jump in 1989. By the late 1960s, gaming taxes were the major source of funding the state budget. Prior to 1969, all casino owners had to go through a background check and be licensed by the state, but for large public companies, that would mean that every shareholder would have to go through a background check, which isn't feasible. I recognized that we simply had to change our laws. We had to get where we could allow corporate gaming. So the banker pushed for legislation to allow big corporations to run casinos. I really feel that more than anything I did along the line on the overall big picture of Nevada that was pushing for corporate gaming and license was the most important thing that I accomplished. In 1963 and 1965, the Corporate Gaming Act was initially defeated because there was fear that mobsters would get behind public companies. But after Howard Hughes started buying casinos, that fear went away. Passage of the Corporate Gaming Act of 1967 and a controversial 1969 bill eventually prompted several large and respected companies to begin buying and building hotel casinos. Investments in casino properties soared after passage of the 1969 law. Howard Hughes left Las Vegas for good in 1970 leaving behind a legacy of corporate money. In his wake, international hotel chains moved in, erecting larger versions of their typical buildings. Las Vegas' architecture and design was about to explode with the flow of funding this provided. Everyone added a tower, and if they already had one, a second. The Stardust opened in 1958 and 10 years later in 1968, the iconic 188-foot-tall sign was installed. The pylon sign was known as the Queen of the Strip and was the tallest freestanding sign in the world for 10 years. A different font was installed in 1991. And in 2007, the Stardust Casino was demolished, but the original letters from the pylon sign remain at the Neon Museum. The last passenger train to Las Vegas arrived in 1968. The Union Pacific Railroad Station was demolished in 1970 to make way for the 26-story Union Plaza Hotel and Casino that opened in 1971. In 1969, Nevada Southern University changed names to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Kirk Kerkorian opened the International on July 2, 1969 as the world's largest hotel with 1,500 rooms and the tallest building in Nevada at 375 feet. The International was the first Y-shaped tower that would become common in Las Vegas. The Mirage, Treasure Island, Bellagio, Mandalay Bay, and Venetian would all have the same Y-shaped towers, while Harris and MGM Grand would add a fourth wing. 
The International was the first Las Vegas casino to have no low-rise hotel buildings, and all casinos in the future would only build high-rise hotel towers. David Schwartz said that with the International, architect Martin Stern set the pattern for Las Vegas Strip casino development for decades. The International has been the Westgate since 2014. Elvis Presley first performed in Las Vegas in 1956 at the New Frontier and 13 years later returned to the International for a second series of Las Vegas shows on July 31, 1969. It was also Presley's first live shows anywhere in eight years. Earning $125,000 per week, this month-long engagement ended up lasting seven years with hundreds of sold-out shows. Mm -hmm.